Good morning and welcome to this Directive Virtual Conference. My name is Sean Golden Carroll. I'm a journalist covering transport and environment issues, and I'll be the moderator for this discussion. So today's event is supported by AB InBev and is titled Zero Carbon Brewing and Beverages, How Can Stakeholder Cooperation Achieve It? So maybe you're the type of person who sits down on a Friday night, orders a glass of your favorite beer, has a sip, and thinks, how is this impacting the environment? Well, if you are, you've come to the right event, because today we'll be discussing beer and sustainability. How can brewing and shipping the world's favorite alcoholic beverage, and indeed its non-alcoholic varieties, uh, be made less carbon intensive? Well, brewing beer relates, relates to more than just what's happening in the factory, of course. It also encompasses agriculture, packaging, distribution, and cooling, all areas in which emissions must be mitigated to meet Europe's environmental goals. Climate change also threatens to curtail the world's beer supply, making green changes even more pressing for both brewers and drinkers alike. So in this virtual conference, we'll be debating responsible drinking, but in a broader environmental sense. But first, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. I'm delighted to be joined by William Neal, Circular Economy Advisor with the European Commission's Directorate General for the Environment, Larissa Capello, Consumption and Production Campaigner with Zero Waste Europe, Barry Ness, Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Sustainability Studies in Lund University, Adeline Farrelly, the Secretary General of the European Federation of Glass Packaging Makers, and Eric Noves, the Vice President of Procurement and Sustainability with AB InBev. So to kick off, I'll invite each panelist to provide a short opening statement, which will be followed by a Q&A session, a, a wider discussion. So this Q&A session will include questions from our viewers, so you're warmly encouraged to submit your questions through the chat. But first, I'd like to give the floor to William Neal of DGM. Uh, William, your opening statement, please. Well, thanks very much, Sean. Um, <clears throat> I'm a, a keen consumer of beer, so I was very interested to join the event this morning. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, as you know, an advisor on circularity, and I'm very interested um, in how circu circular systems can um, contribute towards reducing the, um, uh, the, the carbon emissions from beer production as well. And I, when we talk about circularity, I, I think of it in three possible phases. One is the efficiency with which you use resources as they come in as an input. <clears throat> so with brewing, we're thinking about water, we're thinking about land use and, and, and so on. Then there's the product lifespan and the intensity of use of the product. And I think this is not so relevant uh, when you're talking about um, uh, a fast consumed uh, um, uh, drink like beer. And then thirdly, there's the valorization of the byproducts and the treatment of the waste uh, at the end of the cycle. And I think here, uh, the, I think the first and the third are the most important, the inputs, and then the, the last one. Um, and I think we need to look at how we can best use the, the cascading principle to, to make sure that um, things are, are put to the best use. Um, and one example, um, I, I like beer a lot, but I, I also love Marmites. And any of the people that know um, my home country well will know it's a bit of a divisive issue. But Marmite is made from yeast extract, which comes from the beer making process. So I'd say that's a very high level of valorization of the byproduct of beer making. If you put that yeast or that waste yeast into um, a landfill, it generates 83 uh, kilos of, of CO2 emissions. So obviously we're looking to try and um, really use the byproducts, mostly the brewer's gains and the, and the yeast waste in the best possible way. So um, that could be in aquaculture feed, it could be in uh, making ethanol, uh, it could be for feed for cattle and sheep and so on. So that's what I'm interested to hear about today from the industry and, and how we can improve on that. Thank you very much, William. Uh, next up, we'll move to Larissa Capello. Larissa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be in this debate and uh, to have as well NGOs represented. I think it's really important for uh, um, fruitful discussion on the topic and um, yeah I believe all the the, the stages of the product are important um, regarding sustainability, sustainability. Um, but when regarding um, the waste part so I think I'll 
Yeah, we know that our current linear economy and wasteful society has a lot to do with our carbon footprint. And that includes as well our packaging materials, uses and choices. Um, so today, almost all sectors are dependent on single-use packaging. And, um, and that entails a lot of um, carbon emissions as well. Um, so, so far, policymakers, uh, industry, and uh, other actors of uh, this value chain have focused on recycling. Um, but um, I think this is the time to really close the tap uh, effectively of materials, of resources, as well as and emissions, um, because our planetary boundaries cannot just accept any more trivial solutions, but rather um, resilient and sustainable and long-term ones. So that's why we uh, focus and we urge to shift towards just re re reusable packaging and systems. And there's already a lot of uh, robust data actually on the in not only environmental benefits of reusable systems, but as well social and economic as well, um, including for the beverage sector, uh, which would entail uh, waste savings, energy savings, um, and as well uh, CO savings from CO2 emissions as well. Um, we have actually uh, uh, produced a recent study say, uh, on the life cycle analysis of different packaging materials um, that says that reusable glass bottles produce 85% fewer uh, carbon emissions than a single use one. So there's definitely a lot of potential to be explored there. Thanks. Thank you, Larissa. I'm sure we'll touch on many of those points that you brought up. Um, now I'll hand over to uh, Barry Ness. Barry, your opening remarks, please. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the invitation um, to speak today. Uh, it's always exciting talking about beer sustainability as well. I think more specifically about zero carbon brewing. Um, to get things rolling, from my perspective, I have two points. I think the first one is that I have some kind of self-chosen um, group that I want to represent in the discussions. And this is the myriad small brewers out there that are, exist around uh, the European Union. According to different estimates, 8,000 of them, 11,000 of them, however that might be. But I can one thing I'd like to em emphasize when it comes to beer production and sustainability is this, this idea of the differing circumstances that uh, small producers may face. Uh, and they might be, you know, quite quite substantially different than, um, you know, maybe some of the challenge that AB InBev has with some of the breweries that belong to them, Carlsberg, Heineken, and, and some of the others. So that's the, the first point I have. The other one is, I think, because I am the academic in the group and I always have this uh, pint half empty perspective, I really want to go back and e emphasize the urgency of the situation here, of what we're actually up against. Uh, according to some of the, you could say, studies I've been looking at, we, we're really in need of some kind of abrupt transformative change to this. And obviously, this is also the case within uh, the brewing sector. Uh, by some estimates, uh, we need a 55% carbon dioxide uh, release reduction by 2030 uh, to stay on track with some of the Paris uh, commitments. Um, so what does that really mean for the changes that we need and we need now in the industry. And I will stop there. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, now we'll go to Adeline Farrelly. Um, Adeline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sean, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking AB and Bev uh, for uh, sponsoring this event and this discussion. Um, brewers are, in fact, uh, our biggest customers, and so it's a very, very important sector for the glass packaging industry. And as glass packaging um, suppliers, we are firmly committed to play our part in working with the brewers to reduce the environmental impacts of, of brewing, and in particular focusing, of course, then on, on the packaging. Um, and I think we can help them um, or help you to achieve net, net zero emissions. Um, CO2 reduction is, uh, of course, very important, but it's only one aspect of sustainability. Our society today is also very concerned about other issues, like, for example, circularity, uh, food safety, loss of biodiversity. Um, and we have, in, in the glass sector, we have a great privilege to work with a material that has unique 
um, uniquely inherent sustainability benefits. It's perfectly circular, it's fully reusable and infinitely recyclable, um, and it can be safely recycled in a closed loop into glass bottles and jars uh, fit for food contact over and over again. So it never loses its inherent characteristics. Um, it's also a local industry and uh, we don't depend on any form of critical raw materials and it's inert. So I think that we would like to start by saying that we, we do have a, a perfect packaging which is fit for perfect purpose in every aspect. Um, however, we do need to address CO2 and as suppliers, we can reduce um, carbon footprint of packaging, both um, in the production, in the cooling, the logistics, and the distribution system. And our members are fully committed to becoming climate neutral and fully circular. And we are working on many, many solutions uh, to achieve that in the industries. Uh, but CO2 for us is, is mainly, um, it's, in reality, it's mainly an energy transition issue. 80% um, of our CO2 is emitted from the energy we use to melt glass and 20% from the virgin materials. <clears throat> so if we switch to renewable energy sources and replace our virgin materials with recycled glass, we can reduce our CO2. We can actually eliminate the CO2 emissions. So in addition to the many company initiatives that all our members are taking, we are also working at sector level um, on two projects, Furnace for the Future, and close the glass loop to help us decarbonize the industry and produce a climate friend friendly glass bottle. And I hope to be able to tell you more about those initiatives later. Thank you, Adeline. I'm sure we'll pick that up during our discussion. Uh, but now I'll give the floor to Eric Novez, the Vice President of Procurement and Sustainability with AB InBev. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thanks, Shan, for the opportunity here. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be sharing some of our sustainability initiatives with the group here and to have this discussion to understand how we can collaborate even more uh, towards a better world uh, and a more sustainable world. Uh, just by hearing the introductions of the other panelists, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be an amazing discussion. Uh, they touch it, a lot of different topics that we, are big priorities for our company, so how to uh give a better use for our byproducts our spent grain our spent yeast we, are, we already they already mentioned circular packaging reducing uh energy consumption in packaging how to look at the full supply chain so i'm pretty sure this is going to be an amazing uh an amazing debate as uh you mentioned in the beginning well beer is a natural product it's made of water, hops, barley. So sustainability in that sense is our business. Without sustainability, we cannot brew our beers. Uh, and we have been doing that for the last 600 years as a, a true European company that made it its way to, to the full world, right? So we need to keep that, uh, uh, that momentum. We, we need to guarantee that we are working together and collaborating with other companies, with NGOs, with startups to keep building a more sustainable world. So we are going to be able to enjoy our beers uh, more and more. And maybe not only on the, on the Friday evenings, but Friday evening is a good start. We are on a Friday here. So let's start by joining them and understanding a bit more about their sustainability topics on this Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, well, we'll now move on to the question and answer portion of the event, uh, our wider discussion. And a reminder to our viewers that you're very welcome to submit your questions through the chat. Um, but first, um, Eric, I'd like to stick with you. Um, so there's been numerous reports over the last years that the increased uh, heat waves and droughts caused by climate change uh, will damage global barley crops. Um, is beer at risk? Or is it at least going to become more expensive due to temperature rise? Uh, that, that's a very good point, very important for us. This, for instance, is a year where we are suffering a lot with the, with the barley crops. Uh, and that makes climate change one of the most important topics for our company. Uh, we have been tackling that through carbon, new, uh, carbon reductions in our operations and working together with our suppliers to reduce not only the brewing operations emissions, but the full scope one, two, and three. Uh, if 
most of the people don't know, but uh, the emissions in the, on the brewing operations represent less than 15% of the total emissions uh, on, the brewing, on the brewing sector. So this is, only, this is one important point for us to tackle, but we have to guarantee that we have all the different uh, players working together to, to reduce the emissions on the, on the additional 85%. Uh, so barley is a key ingredient for our beers and we have to guarantee that we are protecting the harvest and the quality of the barley for the years to come. Thank you very much. Um, Barry, I believe you would also like to comment on this topic. Yeah, I would say from the uh, small brewers perspective that uh, I think the answers to your questions or both questions are yes, um, that we see both a um, price increases due to the lack of availability of different ingredients and packaging, uh, different packaging systems that we have in the industry, as well as um, brewers are generally uh, becoming more and more worried about, uh, you know, the increasing impacts on agri particularly agricultural production systems. So we, we saw in Sweden here a 25%, roughly 25% decrease in uh, grain production uh, a few years back, 2017, I believe it was, uh, due to drought here. I think we've all seen the photos of what happened in California. Uh, after that with the fires, particularly with Sierra Nevada Brewery and some of the photos that they were showing on the roof um, from the brewery itself. And then I was also monitoring what was happening in the U.S. Um, with the different, uh, in the hop growing region, regions on the West Coast. So we see that, you know, consistent days of temperatures that are roughly 45 degrees Celsius, you know, can be detrimental to hop growing. And then, of course, lastly, I think many have also seen the different types of uh, images that came from uh, the floods in um, southern Germany and the devastation there to hop production. Well, thank you, Barry. Maybe just a follow-up question. So obviously, um, going carbon neutral, it requires investment. Um, but do you think consumers are ready to pay more for their beer to be carbon neutral? Um, I mean, and even if that is the case, perhaps, in Europe, I'm not sure, but do you think this is something that global consumers would also be willing to pay a bit more to make sure their beer is carbon neutral? Uh, Barry, I'll take oh, that, or? yeah, I'll ask you to answer, <laughs> please. I uh, actually, this is, I mean, from a Swedish perspective, where I do most of my uh, research. Um, I mean, we had a willingness for consumers to pay more money for what could be described as a more sustainable, sustainably produced beer. Um, this is often in the case of organic ingredients or organically certified ingredients where there was that trend, I would say, five, six years ago. Um, does that trend still exist? I'm not sure. Um, the global market is really difficult to say. Um, I'm almost thinking that this is something that's not People, beer consumers are not going to be, it's not a question, are they willing to pay? If they want beer, they're going to have to pay. <laughs> I think this is something that's just the reality of the situation. And we see prices here in Sweden going up now. It's gone up a couple of Swedish crowns per beer now uh, over the last few months that we see this in the retail uh, uh, stores now. Thanks. Um, Eric, I'll put the same question to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we do see some uh, will of the consumers to pay more, but it's it's not that much. But carbon reduction is something that the, the industry will have to tackle independently of the uh, of the willingness of the consumer to pay or not to pay more for for a, a carbon neutral or a carbon reduced beer. So this for us is a big priority. As Barry mentioned before, uh, if we don't tackle that, the impact is going to hit us either in the crops uh, availability, either in the crops cost. So it's something that's inherent to the industry. And it's, it, it's interesting to understand that part of the, of the projects that help us to reduce the carbon emissions, they don't come at an extra cost, of course. Part of those do come when you have to develop a new, a new technology or you have to replace some very expensive equipments and to change the kind of energy that you use 
probably there's going to be a big investment related to that. But part of the reduction can be uh, at at least cost neutral if done in the right way as well. Thank you very much. Um, Larissa, I'd like to go to you now, please. Um, so you mentioned in your opening remarks about the packaging uh, of beer and the need for it to be made greener. Um, what are the challenges and innovations in making packaging greener? Yes, thank you. Uh, so go towards uh, greener, yeah, more sustainable packaging goods and sale. Um, go towards refill. Um, we, we have seen that refillable systems have dropping, uh, but it's mainly due uh, to really the lack of uh, level playing field with uh, single use materials uh, in the market. Um, so one of the challenges for sure is to really overcome these barriers, obstacles uh, for, for reusable systems and create a level playing field in the market with the other materials of single use. Um, so, I mean, the absence of incentives or legal framework as well, uh, standards for reusable packaging. So all this um, can um, hamper like the full potential of, of refillable systems. And, um, and actually we have um, released a study, actually it was yesterday, but about a case study about refillable systems of raw wine uh, in Spain. And it shows really great results in terms of uh, carbon and uh, reducing carbon emissions. So um, even reusing a, a glass bottle for eight, eight times, and a glass bottle could be reused up to you know, 30 times. Uh, so even eight times could already save between uh, uh, up to tw uh, two kilos of CO2 per bottle, um, which is quite a lot. And in the, in the overall project, there was a, a, a reused more than 1,070 tons um, of bottles. So that was uh, quite a lot of emissions uh, to be reduced. Thank you. Um, William, I'd like to ask you the same question from the Commission uh, perspective. Um, what could the Commission do to incentivize or encourage packaging to be made greener? Well, I mean, we, we are trying. I mean, our approach to packaging and packaging waste um, uh, goes back a long time, but we're very much more working now on trying to make sure that the design of packaging is more sustainable um, so we're not just talking about uh, setting targets for recycling and, and uh, taking member states to court that don't achieve it, but with the review of the essential requirements in the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive, um, we are trying to eliminate some of the worst practices. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's really it's a bit like the Eco Design Directive in a sense that it's setting um, minimum standards, but in the past it's been very difficult to apply. Uh, in the real world in the sense that, you know, how do you say whether something is overpackaged or not, for example, um, it's, uh, it's not always uh, easy to uh, interpret. So we, we are trying to, at the moment, um, make that a lot more easily applicable. So that's on the sort of the minimum standards. But then we need to get the extended producer responsibility schemes working properly with eco-modulation, which would really um, which would be more of a top runner approach. It would really uh, incentivize the best forms of packaging and the least impactful forms of packaging. So the, from the regulatory perspective, I think those are the two main um, uh, developments that I think that we should be pushing and that we are pushing. Thank you. Um, Eric, I'd also like to give you the floor for this question. Um, what's AB InBev, InBev's approach to making packaging greener? Uh, well, so packaging is around 50% of the industry uh, carbon emissions, so it's a very important topic for us. And we have a 2025 goal that's to guarantee that 100% of our packaging is either returnable or primarily made of recycled content. So the, the two topics that were mentioned by Larissa uh, are very important to us, so we like and we prefer to offer to our consumers an interesting returnable option, either to returnable glass bottles or to kegs. But whenever we cannot do that and the consumer is choosing uh, a one-way uh, package, we are trying to increase as much as possible the recycled content that we have in this, 
in this package and also working with the industry. So Fab is a, is a big player there together with us to reduce the amount of materials that we use. So how can we develop a lighter bottle? How can we develop a lighter can? And how can we increase the amount of recyclable content in these packages whenever returnability is not an option for the, the consumers? But returnability is our preferred solution. Uh, we have markets where returnable packages are strong and we have initiatives that are being developed with startups in some of the markets where we don't have uh, returnability, a returnable market as a standard. So we are working with a startup called Again uh, in the UK in order to try to de develop a returnable market for, for our own trade there. And we hope this, uh, this initiative is successful so we can spend uh, in the future for uh, more and more uh, POX and uh, the off trade as well. Thank you very much. Um, I see there's a lot of questions coming in on the chat, and I do want to get to those. But uh, first, um, Adeline, I'd like to go to you. Um, you mentioned about the uh, energy intensivity of glass manufacturing. Um, what can and should be done to reduce its carbon footprint? Well, as suppliers, we, we, we can reduce our carbon footprint of our packaging and uh, in the way we produce it and in the, in the cooling phase, the logistics and distribution. And as I said uh, in my opening remarks, that our industry is committed to become climate neutral and fully circle, circular. And we're working on many different initiatives, which involves logistics, but also energy efficiency measures. Um, and we're just testing out new energy sources. And we're also developing reuse options and lightweighting the bottle. So there are many different initiatives taken by the, by the different companies. But um, CO2, as I said, is, is basically an energy transition issue for our industry in that 80% of our CO2 emissions is actually coming from the energy we use to melt our glass. And then 20% is coming from the virgin materials we use um, in our glass. And so uh, what we'd like to do and what we hope to do is to switch to a renewable energy source um, on the one hand and also replace virgin materials in our batch with recycled glass um, to, in order to eliminate the CO2 from the production process. And so um, there are two projects at sector level that we're working on to uh, two strategies, basically. The first one is the Furnace for the Future, which um, is driven by 19 independent glassmakers uh, who are producing packaging. Um, and we want, or they want, to build a hybrid furnace that will run on 80% renewable electricity. Um, and this will dramatically reduce CO2 emissions by 60% if it works. So for our customers, uh, for the brewers, that means low carbon glass bottles. And this, in fact, uh, furnace would be the very first uh, furnace of its kind in the world. And we're, uh, we've applied actually to the ETS Innovation Fund and we're um, hoping to hear back uh, from them soon. Um, so th that basically is, is one part of, of our strategy at sectoral level. Of course, there are many other initiatives taken by the companies themselves, looking at testing out hydrogen, testing out biomass, or different things that are happening also. But at sectoral level, this is one of the projects that we've come together on to try and make our furnace ready for electricity. Um, and the second strategy, a very important one, is closing the glass loop. And basically, every time you use recycled glass in a bottle, you save CO2. So... Um, we have um, initiated a platform uh, bringing all the actors responsible for the collection system in, in Europe together. And so that involves the municipalities, the extended producer responsibility schemes, um, the brands, the recyclers, the producers, because obviously the collection uh, and recycling system is a system. It's not just one actor can do something about the situation. We need to actually all work together. And, um, and so we brought together these partners, including, uh, for example, partners from the wine sector, from, from uh, the spirit sector, and we would be very, very happy to be joined by the uh, brewer sector. Um, this platform is 
is also supported in, by 11 national platforms um, and we're all engaged to collect 90% of all glass bottles put on the market by 2030. And what we'd like to do is not only increase the quantity of glass that's collected, but also the quality. So that the higher the quality in the recyclates, the more uh, recycled content we can put into our, our bottles. So um, that's our second strategy at a sectoral level to try and replace the virgin materials with recycled glass. And I believe that these sectoral projects, along with the another sustainability initiatives in our members will actually combine together to provide the brewers and other sectors with climate neutral and circular packaging. Thank you and I do want to touch on the question of uh, collection and recycling later but um, there's lots of questions coming in on the chat. Um, there's one here from Tiago Brandao um, and this I guess is probably most relevant for Barry and Eric. Maybe you'll start with Barry. Um, would a global and recognized standard, e.g. ISO, to assess environmental score of our beers make it easy and visible uh, to see the brewer's efforts on reducing its product's impacts? Uh, Barry, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, this is one route that could be taken, I think. There are a number of different, you could say, systems out there, measurement systems, sustainability assessment systems, and whatever. Um, coming to, I would say, coming to an agreement on which single system should be used uh, might be very difficult. Um, we see already that, uh, I mean, if you're looking at the sustainability of some of the businesses, we have something, you know, B Corp certification is one way to do this, which is very popular in the United States. Standards maybe are less applicable, I think, from a broader perspective than uh, here in Europe, just because of, uh, uh, you could say, different healthcare systems that are already available and, and so on. So uh, this would be one way to do it, to compare us. To, to compare different uh, products. Um, my experience with working with breweries, I think thus far is that um, we've established a set of sustainability principles, I think that get into not only the environmental aspects, but then extend to social aspects as well. And what I see at least small brewers interested in are the complete impacts of their brewing operations and maybe not single beers. So they're interested in how much carbon they've released in an entire year, for example, how much water that they're actually using in all of their operations and don't focus at the single beer level. Thank you. So um, Eric, I'll go to you. What do you think about an environmental score uh, for beers? Uh, well, first, uh, we think this is a very important initiative. So we applaud the European Commission that's working on launching the green claims uh, legislation. It's very important to to have a playing field to compare the the sustainability impact of different uh, beers and different markets. Uh, we do understand that today different actors are working on different uh, sustainability assessment of the pro uh, of their products. So this is a bit worrying for us because then you start to have different uh, ways of measuring. Uh, and we understand that uh, if we if we can standardize and make it simple to companies and simple to consumers to understand the, the environmental footprint, that's a big benefit for the markets overall. So we want to do it. We, we think that's the right way. We need to get to something that's uh, doable on the company from the company's perspective and easy to understand from the consumer's perspective. So it needs to be standardized and it, it needs to be, uh, in, in a way, simple to calculate and simple to understand. But that's the way to go. Thank you. Well, William, uh, let me go to you um, to hear your perspective. Particularly, I'm interested in hearing more about the proposed uh, product environmental footprint or PEF method. Um, maybe you could give your thoughts on that. Yes, with pleasure. I mean, product environmental footprinting in in the uh, European sense, in the, in the sense that we took it forward, was really launched in about 2014, I think, with the um, single market <clears throat> for green products communication. And already several years, well, I think since 2014, work has gone on on product environmental footprinting for beer, including InBev, uh, Heineken, Carlsberg, uh, including the glass uh producers federation so we have fairly good um and kind of agreed 
approaches towards product environmental footprinting for beer. Um, now, I think that the most important thing is how we use that. And um, the green claims was just mentioned, the idea of um, trying to um, overcome some of the consumer cynicism about green claims. Uh, we have so many labels um, on products saying that they're green, they're eco, whatever. Um, and the idea behind the green claims proposal will be to use consumer legislation to say that if you make a green claim, you have to be able to substantiate that um, with a product environmental footprinting methodology. So the idea is really to, to um, uh, make those claims more credible and reward the, the best performers in that sense. Now, well, the other thing that we're working on at the moment is the digital product passport for products. Now, I, I don't think that this will be applied to food and drink, uh, at least not in the in the um, immediate future. Um, but um, even without any kind of mandatory footprinting, the possibility is there now to um, uh, track and trace products, to have a, an identifier on, uh, for example, a bottle of beer, which you could scan and have access to more information. And I think what is more important than that, because consumer, consumers are already confused, they already have too much information. If you if they go into a, a supermarket and look at the, the vast array of beers that are available um, and then start to try and work out which has the best um, environmental footprint, um, well, I don't think realistically many consumers will do that. But what the idea of a, a, a digital product passport opens up is the idea of, of third parties, that could be a consumer organization or an NGO, actually doing the number crunching, uh, getting the algorithms and being able to provide tailored advice to consumers on which uh, beer would have the, the lowest carbon footprint. So we're a little bit of a way from there, but as, as I just said, the, the environmental footprinting is there for beer. I think um, uh, that we should build on that and actually use that uh, and make it uh, reward the, the best, best product. Thank you, uh, William. I believe that Adeline, you'd also like to comment on PEF. I'll give you the floor. Product environmental footprint methodology is um, welcome insofar as that it is true. It's very, very difficult for consumers to to make out what product is better than another. And and I, I you know, I congratulate the commission for trying to take this on because it's not so easy. Um, but I just want to make a point um, because uh, it's based on LCA, and some people tend to use these methodologies uh, or use LCA to give a priority to carbon footprint. And um, this is not the main environmental impact. There's, there's, it's very, very important, of course, but there are, are also many other um, in, impacts. And we think that it is important for the PEF also to give more weight to impacts on, on the environment and on human health. And, you know, um, if I just mention s some of them, the closed loop recycling, for example, is not captured in, uh, in LCA, toxicity, marine littering, um, leaching of materials into oceans and, and water sources. Um, you know, none of these are taken into account in LCA. Um, there is no um, factor that can uh, include shelf life, for example, that's not taken into account in LCA or quality preservation. And so I know it's already very complex and I'm making it even more complex, but it is important that um, we shouldn't think that the, the LCA is sort of in the current form it is, that is going to give an answer, which is the best in uh, uh, packaging for the, for the environment. And so um, there is a lot of discussion around the validity and the completeness of, of LCA methodology. And for, for the PEF is actually based on that methodology and there are these gaps today. And so we, we would in fact welcome more work on this area to include more holistic um, pr priorities also in, in the LCA methodology. Thank you. Uh, William, would you like to briefly respond? Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that PEF, like uh, Adeline said, is, is extremely complex. It goes way beyond what, what has been done in the past in terms of bringing in the life cycle aspects. And the process, as I mentioned, was very participative. Uh, it was really led by the stakeholders in those value chains. So um, I, I'm sure that there are constraints in the um, actual underlying methodology, 
but I think it is quite a uh, an encompassing, if not an all-encompassing uh, approach. And I would agree, I mean, particularly in brewing, I think that we have to look at things like the biodiversity impact to, uh, uh, in, t in terms of things like land use, water use, pesticide use, and so on. And these are all extremely important. So certainly uh, we should be trying to refine and improve and continue uh, to do that on a, you know, to continue on a continuous basis to, to improve our life cycle assessments. Thank you. Um, I want to take another question from the chat. Um, Larissa, perhaps you could respond to this one. It's from Barbara Supan. Uh, regarding packaging, what is the effort to optimize, for example, the shape and form of packaging in order to cut down on space and transport costs? Do you consider pushing uh, tapping and post-mix systems in gastronomics to cut down on packaging and cooling? What's your, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, all the um, efforts, um, I think, to improve the quality and uh, reduce the, the carbon footprint, et cetera, of packaging are, are of course, welcome. Um, but also there's a need um, to look, like, beyond. Um, and really, I mean, there's no such a thing as a sustainable product or packaging, but rather a sustainable system. So everything needs to be in balance i mean when when you look at the sustainability overall of the yeah the product needs to be in the holistic it's a holistic approach so of course um transport for instance is a factor that needs to be taken into account um for the efficiency of the systems as well um so for instance transportation transportation distance needs to be um rather um optimized as well as the all the logistic um, of, for instance, a, re a refillable system. Um, in the in the case study that we did uh, with the refillable wines, they had the optimal distance between the winery and washing systems, for instance, 60 kilo kilometers. But if you have more, um, more washing systems that could be um, used all together from, with the stakeholders, that would improve not not only the environmental um, environment impacts of the the system as a whole but also the economic uh, the economic part for the for the actors that are involved as well um, so having third parties of washing systems um, it's it's a factor uh, that can improve uh, the overall carbon and environmental um, benefits of the systems as well um, and having as many actors involved as well with pooling systems um, and transportation and reducing transportation systems is uh, it's key as well um, and I just want to like to mention something regarding that uh, Lynn said about the glass um, having the energy intense um, it's like 80 percent of the energy uh, used is to melt the the Use the melt glass, so that is also something another another important uh, factor that why uh, to not go towards more reuse and refillable with this with glasses, for instance, uh, because single use glass has the biggest impact of all the other materials compared to other other single use materials. Um, so it's really important, uh, of course, welcome to improve the quality of the glass or make it lighter, etc. But to really uh, boost this potential of uh, using glass in a reusable and refillable system. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, Eric, um, I'd like to go to you to ask you about some uh, innovative technology. So it was reported that AB InBev uses blockchain uh, to create a kind of farm to table database to increase sustainability. Um, how does this work in practice and how can it make the agricultural side of beer brewing greener? Uh, Eric, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, if Sorry. there's no moment in the in the debate that you put yourself in mute and you start talking, it's not a real debate, right? So <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for that. But uh, this is a very interesting project that we run in the beginning of the year with several partners in our supply chain to guarantee that we would be able to trace all our uh, Leffe beers uh, in the in France from the farmers until the the final consumer. So we work together with the farmers, with the 
uh, the malting uh, companies, with our own breweries and with the distributors to guarantee that we will be able to trace everything. And the consumer could really see uh, where that beer uh, was made, where that barley was produced, and understand the full uh, supply chain of the uh, of his uh, left beer. Uh, it worked really well, so we, we could guarantee that we were mapping uh, all, all the supply chain and giving transparency and, and the full visibility to our consumers. Uh, but it also allowed us to work together with the farmers on sustainability and uh, crop yield practices to increase their productivity. So we have a, a big project that's almost a decade, uh, uh, a decade uh, old now. That's called uh, Smart Barley, and this helps us compare and gives the visibility to the farmers to compare their practices in their farmers in similar farms, and the, to compare the crop yield. So this helps them to improve their productivity, improve their, their yield, and improve their sustainability practices with full visibility of other players and what they're doing in their, in their uh, farms. Thank you. Um, Barry, I believe you also uh, would like to comment. Yeah, I just, uh, I think from, uh, Eric has some great points here, I think from a, a large you know, brewery perspective, but I'm just wondering how this would work for, how could such a system work for small small brewers? You know, if I'm a sole proprietorship or we have a couple people employed as uh, in our organization, you know, how could such a system be brought down to that level? Because we know that, you know, here are the majority of the brewers, you know, the number of brewers in throughout Europe and throughout the European Union. So I'm just kind of seeing some kind of disconnect uh, here for, big versus small yeah no th that's a great question barry and i think that there are some advantages of being big when we we look at this kind of product but there are some disadvantages as well so uh we understood when mapping the project that to do it at scale right now would be would not be easy so we had to select a market and one brand to try to perform the full uh, the full project, because you, as a big brewery, uh, we have several silos, we have several uh, breweries, we have several suppliers. So to guarantee that we'll be able to uh, to give full transparency uh, was a challenge, because we could not mix and match that, and, and uh, a smaller brewer in this sense would have an easier set up i would say that the the other piece where is the advantage of a big brewery right the project's not uh it needs an investment and as a big brewery we were able to make that investment and test in the market but we understand that by doing the investment testing and working on the technology we will be able to guarantee that the te this technology in the future is going to be cheaper and when it becomes cheaper it's probably going to be as uh, accessible to small breweries as well. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages, but I think in the future, this is going to be available for, for each and every uh, brewer size. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, William, I believe you also would like to comment. Yeah, on blockchain, I mean, there, there are a couple of uh, misconceptions about blockchain. And I think one of them is um, that it necessarily uses massive amounts of energy um, people talk, people quote about Bitcoin, you know, using more energy than certain countries. Um, it's not necessarily the case. And the second is that it's um, difficult for micro enterprises and small enterprises. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it is possible to have a blockchain underlying system with uh, quite an easy interface for uh, micro enterprises to use. And Eric was talking earlier on about um, uh, the uh, need for systemic approaches and, and the this the um scope one two and three and looking down down the um supply chain and i think blockchain can be extremely useful uh for doing that and um we're seeing examples uh in textiles and in uh, electric vehicle batteries where where uh, different 
um, actors along the value chain uh, are coming together. So um, I think that the the larger companies feel that it can, of course, help them in terms of um, uh, their due diligence, but also in, in um, knowing what's happening uh, along their supply chain in, in order to be able to quantify it, in order to be able to uh, report on on uh, it in a, a, a more accurate way. And it helps in terms of being able to prove where you're at. And if you want to um, uh, go for green finance using the taxonomy, you need to be able to show uh, what you're doing. If you want to go for green public procurement, uh, you need to be able to show what you're doing. And I think that not only blockchain, but several of the um, more recent digital technologies are enabling that internet of things, big data, and so on. What we're trying to do with the, the European Union digital product passport is to um, establish certain rules so that we have an individual identifier on every product on the European market and data requirements, which would go beyond what might happen voluntarily. Because as I say, there are these voluntary uh, schemes coming up and they're really good, they're very useful, um, but we need to make sure that the right data is available to the right people at the right time. Um, and to make sure that sort of commercially held data is available to somebody that might need it down the chain, um, we sometimes will need to have a, a requirement for that. And I think the other thing is um, digital uh, literacy and, and digital exclusion. We need, to make, we need to make sure when we're facing consumers that this kind of information uh, isn't always that accessible. So we need to, of course, make sure that uh, printed information is, is available as well, not just uh, uh, by scanning and having access to a, a large amount of information. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Adeline, I want to go to you um, just to discuss, again, uh, glass bottles. Um, I believe that you want to um, comment on the previous discussion, but I, in addition to that, I'd also like to ask you your thoughts on, uh, so there's been a discussion on introducing a Europe-wide mandatory deposit refund system for glass bottles and cans. Um, so I'd like you also to hear your thoughts on uh, implementing that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, you won't be surprised to know, I, Larissa, I'd like to just come back on the comment you made about single-use glass bottles being the worst of all materials. And I just would like to, um, well, well, I mean, pick you up on that because I think that's such a sweeping statement that it's not a really fair statement to make. Um, and it, first of all, um, you know, uh, we, we just spoke about the LCA has certain gaps and, and it's notoriously unreliable. And so I don't know what indicator that you're focusing on uh, to make that statement, but I, I think that that it should be qualified. And I, I take, you know, I, I would ask you to take note of the fact that, um, you, you know, uh, you need to look at the product. And the, and the system, because you pointed out that systems are important, not just the products. And so I, I think that, that that's not, not a fair statement to make. And I w just want to point that out, that that's really, um, it, it's not right. Um, so DRS, um, I would like to just make a couple of points on DRS. <clears throat> First the point I want to make is that DRS is, for waste prevention is about reusability, bringing back your bottle to be reused. DRS for waste recycling is about one-way packaging. And so we need to be clear about what we're talking about. And in this particular case, I think your question, Sean, is on the DRS for one-way packaging, single-use packaging, if you like. Um, and we do not, think that this is the right way to go for glass. It may be for other materials, but for glass, um, the reason we say this is, first of all, a DRS for recycling is cherry picking just a part of the waste. And so for glass, it'll only be taking some of the glass uh, bottles, but it will leave all the rest of glass for the EPR schemes. So DRS, only chooses just a little part of the waste, not all the waste. And um, we, we have to recognize that glass has been successfully collected um, for recycling via curbside and bottle banks for decades. 
and we've doing doing this through the extended producer responsibility schemes and we have been able to achieve through those schemes a very high 76 percent collection of all glass bottles put on the market are collected for recycling in the eu so if you introduce a new drs collection system for recycling to, for one-way packaging you're just creating a parallel system and you destroy the existing system and so therefore we are are not in favor of including glass into a drs for one-way packaging just for recycling um, we glass is much more effectively um, collected in bulk and unlike plastics, it doesn't need to be separated from the glass for food and the glass for non-food. We can be collected all together because the recycling process, and the manufacturing process is a purifier process. And therefore, we don't need to take out the beverage bottles from the collection system and put them into the retailers. With glass, you can just put everything together. And so we, we, really, we really caution the fact that a DRS for recycling is is about creating a parallel system that will render the existing systems less efficient. Thank you. Um, Larissa, I'd like to give you the chance to respond and also to hear your thoughts on DRS. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just about the glass. Yeah, indeed, was a LCA analysis review of the single use versus reuse reusable packaging. But looking to the brighter side of glass, glass reusable glass has the most potential uh, of reducing carbon footprints. So indeed, it's an amazing product that should be employed for reusable systems and refillable. But of course, yeah, all the the um, the systems where the product is inserted, it's really relevant. Um, and in terms of DRS, well, uh, we support DRS, of course, for both uh, single use, um, one way, I mean, and reuse. Um, so DRS has proven to be the most effective and successful way to achieve full circularity of materials. Um, and this is many studies to up to 95%. Um, of collection um, and uh, regarding having the, the glass included, of course, we, we very much support the glass to be included, of course, for reuse and refill. This is quite obvious, but also for one way as well and recycling um, because not having glass that could uh, uh, provoke market distor distortions as well. So having including all materials um, all packaging material is not important to avoid these market distortions with other materials as well, but also as the consumer perspective to be um, to have to know that all the materials will have the same um, end, you know, um, and um, and as well up to date, I think ten member states already have in, uh, are expected or have approved it or are in, in, in progress of doing or implementing DRS at national level. Uh, so we believe there is strong legislative framework coming from the from the EU um, uh, to assist this national implementation and harmonize this implementation as much as possible in terms of guidelines or effective of how this the system should be implemented. Of course, um, taking into account the, the national situations as well. Um, would be uh, would be the best, um, and we believe the packaging packaging waste directive is the uh, is the the revision of the directive is the best place also uh, to have some essential requirements um, for DRS systems. And um, yeah, this is we, we have released as well um, a statement uh, not uh, some weeks ago with uh, UNIS, the National Media Waters Europe as well, supporting for the inclusion of the essential requirements and packaging packaging revision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've, we've touched on packaging, we've touched on agriculture, but of course, transport uh, is a large part of beer brewing and uh, it also contributes to emissions. So I want to briefly look at transport. Um, how can we best reduce the emissions from uh, the shipping of beer? Um, should there be stricter emissions limits placed on trucks? Um, maybe this is, from a policy perspective, higher taxes on shipping and aviation emissions. Um, 
Well, maybe actually, Eric, I'll start with you just to hear what's AB InBev's approach to cutting emissions for transport? Perfect. Uh, well, there are several uh, initiatives that we put in place in order to reduce carbon emissions on, in transport. Uh, starting by the first one or the, the most uh, critical, beer is a very local product. We are a global company, but we have uh, hundreds of brewers uh, all around the world, and we usually produce the beers in the communities where we sell them. So by guarantee that we are producing locally and sourcing locally, you are already reducing your carbon emissions in, the, uh, in that production site. When we go to the transport itself, we are a category agnostic company and we are working together with different suppliers to understand what are going to be the technology of the future on decarbonizing transport. So we have been working over the last years on reduced emission trucks, mainly talking about LNG, CNG trucks that help the re helped us reduce between 15 and 20 percent of our emissions. But at the same time, we are working with some suppliers to understand what's going to be the zero emission technology. So we are working on electrical uh, vehicles and also on hydrogen powered vehicles, on green hydrogen powered vehicles. Uh, those are technologies that are still being developed, right? Uh, hydrogen is still on a, a more initial phase, uh, but they, those are probably going to be the, the future solution in the next years for uh, really decarbonizing and go for a zero emission uh, transport of beer. We have already launched, just to, to finalize here, we have already launched uh, pilots in most of our European countries with uh, zero emission uh, trucks with ele electrical vehicles. And we are now running a pilot on, on a hydrogen uh, powered truck here in Belgium as well. And we announced last week uh, a hydrogen power plant in the UK that's going to provide the energy for our uh, beer production, so for our brewery and our site, but also it's going to provide uh, fuel, hydrogen as fuel for our trucks in the UK as well. Thank you very much indeed, Eric. Interesting to hear about the various uh, approaches being taken. Um, maybe, William, I can go to you just to hear from a policy perspective. Um, how do you think the Commission can encourage uh, low emission or zero emission logistics? Well, I'm afraid, Sean, that's not really my area. I mean, uh, either on the transport side or on the on the emissions side. So I'll pass on that one. <laughs> I'll go to Barry. Uh, Barry, I believe you'd like to comment. Yeah, I can make a couple small comments on this from a small producer perspective. Um, one thing that we need to think about here, I think, is the broader transport system that's in place for, for transport. So we have, of course, what uh, Eric's been talking about and maybe the change over to hydrogen vehicles and this type of thing, but also the system um, where beer goes, how beer gets transported, how ingredients get transported, and et cetera, that also becomes important. I can just give a quick example. In Sweden, uh, we have the Swedish liquor monopoly system, Belaget, that has, to my understanding, only one distribution hub in the country. So what happens is, often happens is with the, where I am down in the south of Sweden is that, uh, brewers pack their beer on a truck, they ship it up to somewhere closer to central uh, Sweden, and then it gets shipped back down maybe a week later back down to our region again. And this is really foolish, I think, from a, <laughs> from a transport perspective. So we need to look where we have these, this low-hanging fruit, I think, with transport and just ways to eliminate transport. Another thing to think about is, you know, how do we combine where multiple breweries combine different uh the transport of their beer um, to different retail establishments, for example, and do this together instead of, you know, packing five pallets on a truck and shipping it that we pack 15 pallets on a truck from uh, breweries in the vicinity and then try to have the efficiency or the carbon carbon gains in that respect as well. Very much indeed. Um, there's another question um, coming in on the chat. Um, and it's uh, for Eric, Barry, and William. Um, maybe, Eric, I can start with you. Um, 
it's a, a very, it, it's about agriculture, um, and it's uh, quite specific. It says, regarding uh, scope three emissions from cultivation of barley, what is your view on potential methods to reduce these? Um, the use of protected urea, more biologically produced fertilizers. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on reducing the emissions from the cultivation of barley? Yes, we, we do have, as I mentioned before, the Smart Barley Program. That's a, bar, uh, that's a program that compares best practices between different farmers and tries to uh, inform uh, the other farmers how to reduce uh, their emissions while increasing their productivity. Uh, but we are right now testing some pilots on regener regenerative uh, agriculture that are mainly a big bet for the future uh, on both guaranteeing that we're going to have the soil fertile for the, the future crops, but also much, uh, much more sustainable practices on farming. So this is a big bet for the company for the next years. Thank you very much. Um, Barry, would you like to comment at all about the agricultural side? Yeah, I don't have too much to say on this specifically. I can just say from a little bit broader perspective, I think there's always the debate between what uh, Eric has kind of mentioned already, and this is this idea of local production versus, you know, different types of also cropping systems when it when it comes to barley or whatever, if this is organic, uh, certified organic systems and so on. So uh, it's more of a, this debate rages on, I think. We want something that may be produced in a slightly more impactful way, depending on the indicators that we're actually looking at and, and be local, or is it something that's actually, you know, coming from, from a longer distance then, but is produced organically. So that's about all I can add on that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, maybe, Barry, just staying with you, um, I wanted to ask you about a, a, an article I read. And the article basically said that climate change might come into conflict with traditional approaches to brewing beer um, and that we may need to change our traditional mindset uh, and accept that beer brewing may need to be altered uh, to cut carbon emissions. And this is basically the way that we cultivate beer might need to change. Um, what are your, Do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, do we, could it be the case that we might need to adapt our mindset towards beer? Yes, definitely. And I think, I mean, it's starting to happen in certain realms, I think, in, at least in discussions. Um, it needs to happen um, at all phases. So, of course, we've been talking with Adeline and Larissa about, you know, packaging systems and this type of thing. Obviously, there needs to be, you know, rather abrupt changes there already. We need to look at the agricultural production systems and the, you know, this, how we actually are producing the ingredients, where we're sourcing them from, how we're sourcing them, um, certification systems around them, et cetera. And then, you know, the actual production. Uh, brewery equipment. I think it was Eric that maybe mentioned that, you know, we have, you know, brewery equipment. What kind of changes can we make in the actual, you know, in the breweries themselves and the equipment they're actually using to then decrease emissions and so on. So there, and then of course we move beyond that in the, you know, in the life cycle of beer or whatever into more transport of the, the beer itself and how we distribute beer and so on. So I, this will be, as I said, will be forced upon us. I think this is not something that we can, you know, we can think about making the changes. I think that we will need to make these changes based on, you know, changing climatic conditions, uh, ingredient uh, supply change being disrupted and so on. So I'm not too optimistic about that right now, I guess. Thanks. Uh, Eric, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, it will, it's already driving changes in the industry, but I don't see them from a negative perspective. I, I think those are positive changes. So uh, we are more and more analyzing each of our process inside our breweries, uh, the equipments we use, the technology we use and understanding how we, how we can uh, modernize that, improve the technology and reduce uh, the energy consumption and reduce the carbon emission. So I, I see that from a very positive way. And I see collaboration in the market uh, in that sense as well. So uh, more and more, we, we have been working together with startups to develop technologies for part of the, pro uh, of the process where we still are not sure, we're not sure how to decarbonize it or how to reduce the emissions or reduce the, the usage of energy. And there are companies that are working uh, relentless in that direction. So 
this has been the, the this kind of challenge has dri has been driving the industry to modernize itself. So it's it's amazing to hear Adeline saying uh, about the furnace of the future, and this is an in uh, uh, the emissions on on less productions by 60 80 percent but this is just a reality now because we have been driving that forward right that there's pressure for the industry to decarbonize so this kind of technology it's being uh born with this new effort so i i think it's it's for the best not uh, i'm very optimistic about the changes in the in the beer industry and in the full supply chain at our suppliers uh of packaging materials, our farmers, and also the transport industry and the cooling systems. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the time, and uh, we're almost at the end of today's session, uh, but I would like to give you each the chance to give uh, closing remarks. Um, so I'd ask you each to summarize the main message that you would like our audience to take home with them, and it's been a very wide-ranging discussion. Um, I'd ask if you could keep it to just a sentence or two, please, because we do want to try and finish on time. Um, but um, Eric, I'll, I'll start with you, give you the floor again. Um, your closing remarks, please. Well, first, thanks a lot for the debate. Very rich, full, and, and really good to hear the, the different opinions um, and how, how we can complement each other. Uh, sustainability is a huge task. It's a huge priority, is our business. And you, you, I think today what it was good to share some, but we didn't have time to share all of our practices, but it's something that we're not gonna be able to do alone. So it's really important that we connect more and more, that we collaborate with different actors in order to guarantee that as a society, we can improve our, our practices and drive us to a more sustainable and better world. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now I'll give the floor to Adeline Farrelly, the Secretary General of the European Federation of Glass Packaging Makers. Um, Adeline, your closing remarks, please. Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, it was great to participate in today's debate. Um, I want to leave the, you with the message that we are fully committed to becoming climate neutral and fully circular, and we um, uh, we're, we're working on projects really to get there and we want to be able to offer the brewers a reusable option but also a one-way packaging option because it makes sense to do that and so we are going to be working on our energy sources we're going to be running on renewable electricity uh, or other renewable energy sources in the future and that's what our plan is to do is to be able to provide you with the right packaging so that um, you can be uh, achieve your net zero emissions. And as a collaboration, I'd like to call on the brewers to join us and close the glass loop to try and work on our recycling. And I would also like to um, uh, invite you to check out the gl glass hallmark. We have a glass hallmark to communicate to consumers about sustainability. And I would invite you to go and check out that uh, information and yeah, work with us uh, as we go through this journey to transition. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'll hand over to Barry Ness of Lund University. Uh, Barry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I appreciate it. And this was really a great forum and I, I learned a lot. Um, and I can say, I guess my, my main point on um, to kind of finish things off here is that from the perspective of all the the small small brewers uh, around the European Union, that I think it's really important to devise policies, come up with policies that really resonate with them, that are really important to them. I think a lot of the discussions we've had, we've we've gained the AB InBev perspective on on things, which is really important. But there's a lot of other brewers out there that I would say some of these policies, some of the different initiatives often miss. And I think that uh, we need to pay particular attention to this group of brewers as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I'll hand over to Larissa Capello of Zero Waste Europe. Larissa, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a really interesting and fruitful debate and uh, really keen to see the brewing sector uh, to move towards sustainability. And yeah, we believe that to, to, uh, to achieve these goals, a really shift on the way where we consume and produce products and materials needs to change and to move away from business as usual and uh, really redesign products and systems from the outset. Uh, and we believe the revision of the packaging directive represents a big opportunity for uh, to support um, to move away from the just recycling, uh, but uh, to, towards effectively closing the loop, um, and to have some policy to support this transition, support all the actors in these transitions by putting in place reuse targets, packaging formats, um, harmonization, economic incentives, and as well supporting implementation of the policy return schemes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And last but certainly not least, William Neal, the Circular Economy Advisor with the European Commission's Directorate General for the Environment. Your closing remarks, please. Well, thanks, Sean, and thanks very much for the, the, the great debate. Uh, Sean, you, you said something which made me laugh a bit because you talked about traditional brewing, the, tr the challenges for traditional brewing. And I think the beer that we drink today is nothing like the beer we drank 100 years ago. Um, it's continually changing it's a, i think the companies uh, the, the big companies are in, extremely innovative and we can see we've seen today the uh, the willingness to to improve and to change and to become more sustainable which is really welcome but also the smaller ones the disruptive ones who are continually changing things i think the importance has been re-emphasized today of systemic approaches for that we need good ways to measure impact throughout the chain and life cycle uh, analysis, no matter how much people complain about it, usually when it's not going their way, it is the best way that we have and we need to, to continue to improve that. But also I think that uh, digital technologies, tracking and tracing will revolutionize um, the way we um, become more, more systemic in our approaches. We need to look at upstream and downstream impacts. I think if you look at the fact that um, landfilling um, of um, uh, brewers' grains, so the, the, the byproduct of, of brewing, uh, produces 300 kilos of, of CO2 per tonne, uh, yet that can be used to feed animals, which presumably means we use less soy to feed animals. So if you look at those knock-on effects, that there is huge potential there, and we really need to uh, um, exploit that potential. And just a final remark, I think the, it was suggested at one point that this all comes at a price for consumers and um, this sort of gilet jaune um, argument. And I don't think it's necessarily the case. If you're talking about efficiency in materials, efficiency in energy, um, you're talking about capital replacement, which can be done in the normal replacement cycles. There are intelligent ways to actually uh, reduce emissions and to become more um, resource efficient and circular. So um, I don't think necessarily there has to be a negative social impact. So um, I hope that we can continue to drink our beers at a reasonable price. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you very much. That brings us to the close of today's conference. But I would like to thank all of our panelists for their excellent contributions. Uh, thank you to AB InBev for supporting today's debate. And of course, thank you to you, the viewers, for joining us. Um, if you want to watch this virtual conference back, you can find it online at the Your Active YouTube channel. Uh, well, that's all from the Your Active Studio for now. But in the meantime, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.